Okay, finite factored sets. Uh, so I'll start with some context. Uh, for people who are not already familiar with my work, my main motivation is to reduce existential risk. I try to do this by trying to figure out how to align advanced artificial intelligence. I try to do this by trying to become less confused about intelligence and optimization and agency and various things in that cluster. My main strategy here is to develop a theory of agents that are embedded in the environment that they're optimizing. I think there's a lot of uh, open, hard problems around, around doing this. And this leads me to do, to do a bunch of weird math and philosophy. Uh, and this, this talk is going to be an example of some weird math and philosophy. Uh, for people who are already familiar with my work, I just want to say that according to my personal aesthetics, I think the subject of this talk is about as exciting as logical induction, which is to say I'm really excited about it. Uh, and so, And I'm really excited about this audience. I'm excited to give this talk right now. OK, so first, this talk can be split into two parts. We will first have a short pure math combinatorics talk. I suspect that if I was better, I would instead be giving a short pure math category theory talk. But I'm trained as a combinatorialist, so I'm giving a combinatorics talk up front. Uh, and then part two is going to be a more philosophical talk. It's going to be the main talk. Uh, this talk can also be split into five parts differentiated by color. There will be title slides, motivation slides, table of contents, main body, and examples. This gives 10 distinct sections, which will be labeled by the ordered pair on the bottom left. Um, yeah, so I have this chart that, that uh, shows what slide numbers these various different sections will occupy. Uh, for example, this slide is in part one talk, and it's, in, it's a table of contents slide, which you can see in the ordered pair. Uh, I recognize that this table of contents has a lot more table and a lot less content than most table of contents, but that's OK, because there will be another one in six slides. All right, here's some background math. Set partitions. Uh, a partition of a set S is a set X of non-empty subsets of, X, of S called parts, such that for each element of S, there exists a unique part in X that contains that element. Uh, you can basically view this as a way to view S as a disjoint union. Um, I'm expecting uh, I'm expecting this, this slide to mostly be background. Uh, so we'll, we'll write part S for the set of all partitions of S. We'll say that a partition is trivial if it has exactly one part. We'll use this bracket notation to uh, denote the unique part that contains an element. So this is like the equivalence class of a given element. And we will use this tilde notation to say that two elements are in the same part. Um, you can also think of partitions as kind of like variables on your set S. So a partition is a is it has is a variable that can take on multiple different values where the values correspond to which part an element is in. You can also think of it as like a question that you could ask about a generic element of S. So if I had an element of S and I, it was like hidden from you and you wanted to ask a question about that element, this a partition kind of like corresponds to the information state of a question that you could ask about that element. Um, we're also going to use uh, the lattice structure of, of partitions. So we will say that one partition is a finer is finer than another partition. We'll say x is finer than y. If x makes all of the distinctions that y makes and maybe makes some more distinctions, and so x will kind of like break, you, you kind of break your set into parts y, and then you break it further into smaller parts uh, x. And this is what it means for x to be finer than y, and similarly what it means for y to be coarser than x. And then we have the notion of the common refinement of two partitions, x and y, is the coarsest partition that is finer than both x and y. Um, and this is well defined, uh, which I'm not going to show. OK, uh, so hopefully this is all mostly background. Uh, and now I want to show something new, set factorizations. A factorization of a set S is a set B of non-trivial partitions of S, which are called factors, such that for each way of choosing one part from each factor in B, there exists a unique element of S in the intersection of those parts. So this is maybe a little bit dense. Um, my short 
uh, tagline of this is a factorization of S is a way to view S as a product in the exact same way that a partition was a way to view S as a disjoint union. Um, and uh, it, like, if, if you get one definition from like the first talk here, it's it's going to be this. Like, what is a factorization? I'll try to like attack it from a bunch of different angles to hopefully communicate the concept. Um, so if we have a factorization of S, so so B B zero through B n is factorization of S. Then we're going to have a bijection between S and the product of all of the individual factors B. Now bijection is going to is going to kind of come from if you take an element of S and you send it to the tuple that is all of the parts containing that element, like the part from each factor containing that element, uh, and so we get a bijection here. And as a consequence of having a bijection here, uh, we get that the cardinality of S will just be the product of the cardinalities of the individual factors, and so it's, we're really like we're viewing S as a product of these individual factors that are uh, sets that don't really have any more structure than uh, the way that they're represented as being a product that gives you S. Uh, we'll write fact S for the set of all factorizations of S. And we'll say a finite factored set is a pair S comma B, where S is a finite set and B is a factorization of S. Um, this is kind of like a circularly defined definition. Uh, well, not really circular. It, it's like if I wanted to find a factored set, there are kind of two strategies I could do. I could first introduce the S, and then I could say get a factorization of S. Alternatively, I can kind of first introduce the B, and anytime I have a, a collection of sets B, I can kind of take their product, and then I can have S be the product of those sets, uh, modulus some degenerate cases where things are zero. Um, and so maybe another way to think about it is instead of having S first, you can imagine just having B first, which is a collection of arbitrary sets. And then you identify with the elements of B with uh, just the information of, of what they do in the product. Uh, so to me, this notion of factorization is just extremely natural. It's basically the multiplicative analog of a set partition. Uh, and I really want to like push that point. Uh, so here's another attempt to push that point. Uh, the set factorization definition can really be seen as dual to the partition definition in the sense that I can I could take this definition and kind of dualize a whole bunch of words and get the same definition out. Uh, so a partition, this is like a slightly modified definition from the ones I gave before, a partition of S is a set X of non-empty subsets of S such that the obvious function from the disjoint union to, to S is a bijection. Um, and so uh, for, each, for each subset in X, you kind of have this inclusion function, and then you kind of add them all together in your, in your disjoint union, and this gives you a function, and you want this function to be a bijection. That's what it means to be a partition. And then if I uh, kind of dualize all of these words, I get that a set B of non-trivial partitions of S, a factorization is a set B of non-trivial partitions of S, such that the obvious function to the product of the elements of B from S is a bijection. Uh, yeah. So hopefully this is, ho hopefully you're now kind of convinced this is an extremely natural notion. Uh, Scott, in one sense, question, it seems like in one sense you're treating subset as dual to partition, which I think is valid. And then in other sense, you're treating factor set as dual to partition. Yeah. Those are both valid, but I think maybe it's worth talking about the two different kinds of duality yeah. or something. Yeah, I think that what's going on there is that there's kind of two ways to view uh, a partition. There's, you can view a partition as like that which is dual to a subset, and you can also view a partition as something that is built up out of subsets. And so I'm like dualizing, I'm like dualizing in one way and I'm dualizing the other way. Uh, Ram, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I was just going to check. You said um, the B can you can start with an arbitrary B and then like build the S from it. Is that yeah? Is that it can be literally any set, and then there's there's always like an S. Uh, if if, if none if none of them are empty, if none of them are if some of them are empty, you'll run into a problem. But if none of them are empty, you could just like take a collection of of sets that are kind of arbitrary elements, and you can kind of take their product 
And then you can kind of identify with the elements of the set, the partition that corresponds to the partition of the product. Or sorry, you can identify with, with like each of the elements of your set, the subset of the product, which is the kind of the projection, or the, the part of the product ah. that kind of projects onto that point. Uh, and so you can- right. so, the, so the S in that case will just be tuples. That's yeah, so the S will just be tuples. That's okay, right. Thanks. But Scott, given a set, I find it very easy to come up with partitions. Um, yep. But I find it less easy to come up with factorizations. Do you have any tricks? Yeah, so I, must, uh, I think I should probably just go to the, the example slide then. Okay, great. I'm about, to, I'm about to go through examples of, of factorizations. Can I ask one more uh, before you do that? Yes. Can you allow um, uh, uh, factors to have uh, one element in them? Uh, yeah, so I said non-trivial. Non-trivial means it does not have one element. I think non-trivial means not have one element and not have no elements. Uh, the way that I define it, non-trivial means that it's not a one element partition. Okay. And so the empty set has a partition with no parts and I will call that ah, okay. non-trivial. Uh, but the empty set thing is not that, that critical. Okay, uh, I'm now going to move on to some examples. So exercise kind of, except I'll probably interrupt before you can actually solve it. Uh, what are the factorizations of the set zero, one, two, three? I'm gonna talk again in like 30 seconds. All right, so first we're going to have a kind of trivial factorization. You can kind of do this for any set, as long as your set doesn't have one element, which is we only have one factor, and that factor is going to be the discrete partition, right? If you have one factor and this is a discrete partition, kind of for each way of choosing one part from each factor, it's just what each way of choosing one part from the discrete partition, which is going to be the element uh, in that part. And then we want. Uh, some, some less trivial factorizations. Uh, and since the cardinality of our set S here is four, in order to have a factorization, uh, we're gonna have to have some partitions and the product of the cardinalities of our partitions are going to have to equal the cardinality of our set S. And so we're gonna have two partitions and they're each gonna have to have cardinality two so that, so that uh, they can multiply together to give to get to get four. Um, yeah, so we can say another thing about these two partitions in our factorization, which is they're going to have to break your set into parts of equal size because of the the way that you kind of view it as a product, you can kind of tell that each partition is going to have to have equal size. And so, if I'm going to have a factorization of zero, one, two, three that isn't this trivial one, I'm going to have to pick two partitions of my four element set that uh, each break the set into two parts. And there are three partitions of a four element set that break it up into two parts. And for each way, way of choosing a pair of these three partitions, I'm going to get a factorization. Uh, so there will be four factorizations of a four element set. Um, yeah. And I, I kind of like draw them here with these little with these little uh, squares that hopefully it's clear what they mean. Um, yeah, so in general, if I have a uh, finite set of size n, you can ask how many factorizations are there of a set of size n? And here's a little chart that shows you how many how many factorizations there are of a set of size n. Um, You'll notice that if n is prime, there will be a single factorization, which hopefully makes sense. Uh, 
a very surprising fact to me is that this sequence did not show up on OEIS, which is like this database that combinatorialists use to check whether or not their sequence has been studied before. Uh, to me, this just feels like the multiplicative version of the bell numbers. The bell numbers count how many partitions there are of a size, a set of size n. If sequence number 110 on OEIS out of over 300,000, and this just doesn't show up, and I am just like genuinely confused by this fact. Um, it's it's yeah. To, to me, this feels, feels like a very natural thing, and it seems to me like it hasn't really been studied before. Uh, yeah, this is the end of my short combinatorics talk. Uh, any questions that want to happen now could happen now. If you're willing to do it, I'd appreciate like just stepping through the um, one of the examples of the factorizations and the definition, because this is pretty new to me. And yeah, so in the definition, I said a factorization should be a uh, collection, a set of partitions. Uh, so we're going to go through this uh, second example, like the first non-trivial one on this slide, right? We want a set of partitions such that for each way of choosing one part from each of the partitions, there will be a unique element in the intersection of those parts, right? So if you look at the first one, I have this partition that's separating uh, zero, the small numbers from the large numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1 from 2, 3. And I also have this partition that's separating the even numbers from the odd numbers, 0, 2 from 1, 3. And the point is that for each way of choosing either small or large, and also choosing either even or odd, there will be a unique element of my set that is the conjunction of these choices. Uh, and then the other ones, instead of uh, small and large and even and odd, I use this uh, like inner or outer distinction. And I could also uh, break it up like that. Uh, yeah, you wanna say something, David? You're muted. You have to wait till the end, but I'll just say it now since I'm here. Um, and for partitions and for many things, like if I know the partitions of a set A and the partitions of set B, then I know some partitions of A plus B, the disjoint union, or I know some uh, uh, partitions of A times B. Um, is that true? Or do you know any facts like, well, I thought, yeah, do you know any facts like that for factorizations? Like, are there? Yeah, if I, yeah, I mean, if I had two factored sets, I can kind of combine them to get, like, I can get a factored set over their product, which kind of just like copies the, it kind of disjoint unions the two factors, the two like collections of factors. Uh, for the additive thing, you're not gonna get anything like that because like, like prime sets don't have any non-trivial factorizations. Cool, uh, Andrew? Um, are you able to, I wonder if we're able to see your mouse while you're presenting. This is just a technical question. Like, can you see okay, my mouse cool. now? Yeah, I want to make a bid for when you refer to a part of your slide and you speak like a paragraph of text to refer to where okay. you, you could also select sure. it. And I think it might be, because sometimes I'm not sure what part of your slide you're talking about. Awesome. Thank well, you. All right. Well, whatever. Yeah. Even if you just like gesture around it with the mouse, it'll be, yeah. it'll be helpful. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, I think I'm going to move on to the main talk. All right. The main talk. It's going to be about time. So uh, I want to give some background and talk about the Perlian paradigm of causal inference. So I want to start by just saying that I think the Perlian paradigm for causal inference is great. It's uh, this buys me some some crackpot points, but I'll say it's it's the best thing to happen to our understanding of time since Einstein. Um, yeah, so Perl has this paradigm. I'm not going to go into all the details here. I expect some people have already seen it. It won't, uh, it, like my, my talk will not be fully, will not be technically dependent on it. It's here for motivation. Um, we're given a collection of variables and a joint probability distribution over those variables. And Perl can infer causal 
or temporal relationships between the variables. I am here going to use causal and temporal uh, interchangeably, uh, which maybe philosophically there's more to say there. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to use uh, causal and, and temporal interchangeably. Uh, yeah, so Perl can infer temporal data from statistical data, which is kind of like going against this adage that like correlations not imply causation. It's like Perl's like taking the combinatorial structure of your correlation and using that to infer causation, which I think is just really great. I want to um, interject because like I may be wrong, but I think this is false, or I think that that's not all you need, or that's not all Perl needs just the joint probability distribution over the variables? Like, doesn't he also make use of intervention distributions? Uh, in a lot of his theory, like in the theory that that is described in like chapter two of the book Causality, he's not really using other stuff. Pearl like builds up this bigger theory that he's like, oh, there's all this other stuff that that's more data that you don't get from the other thing. But they're just like, there's, you have the ability to uh, maybe assuming some simplicity or assuming some whatever, you have like, I think some strong ability to take a joint distribution and infer, take a collection of variables and a joint distribution over those variables and uh, making some assumptions, but not uh, like extra information assumptions infer correlation from, or yeah, infer causation from correlation there. Ramana, it depends a lot okay. on the structure of the underlying causal graph. For some causal graphs, you can actually recover them uniquely with no interventions. Um, and almost like only zero, only assumptions with zero measure exceptions are needed, which is like right, really but, strong. But but like then the information you're using is the graph. No, like, you're not. No, 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 no. Just the joint distribution. Like oh, if okay, nature, sorry. there, okay, there exist it, yeah. causal graphs with the property that if nature is generated by that graph and you don't know it, and then you look at the joint distribution, you will yeah. you will infer with like probably one that nature was generated by that graph without having done Got any it. interventions. That makes yeah. sense. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Um, I am going to a little bit uh, go against this, though, and I'm going to claim that Perl is kind of cheating when doing this thing. Uh, and the thing I want to point out is that given a collection of variables is actually hiding a lot of the work. Like in this sentence that I will point to to make Critch happy up here, given a collection of variables and a joint prob probability distribution over the, those variables, really the emphasis is put on this joint probability distribution. Like you're thinking like, oh, I'm inferring from a statistical, I'm inferring like causality from statistics. But I, wa I wanna make like, like a large part of my thesis is that given a collection of variables is hiding a lot of the work, right? Pearl is not inferring temporal data from statistical data alone. He is inferring, uh, temporal data from statistical data together with factorization data, how the world is broken up into these variables. Um, I claim that this issue is also entangled with a failure to adequately handle abstraction and determinism. Uh, to point at that a little bit, one could do something like say, well, what if I take the variables that I'm given in a, in a Perlian problem or something, and I just forget that structure and I just take the product of all these variables that I'm given. And then I consider the space of all partitions on that product of variables that I'm given. And each one of those partitions will be its own variable. And then I try to do Perlian causal inference on this big set of all the variables that I kind of get by forgetting the structure of variables that were given to me. And the problem is when you do that, you have a bunch of things that are deterministic functions of each other. And you can't actually like infer stuff using the Perlian paradigm. Um, and so, in my view, this cheating is very entangled with the fact that Perl uh, doesn't do great with handling abstraction and determinism. OK, so we're going to do better. Uh, main thing we're doing this talk is we're going to introduce an alternative to Perl that does not rely on factorization data and will therefore kind of work better with abstraction and determinism. Where Perl was given a collection of variables, we are going to just consider all partitions of a given set uh, where Perl kind of infers a DAG, Perl infers a directed acyclic graph. We're going to infer a finite factored set. Uh, in the Perlian world, we can kind of look at the graph and read off properties of like time and orthogonality. Uh, I, I'll use the word orthogonality and independence uh, orthogonality and independence are pretty similar. I'll use orthogonality when I'm talking about it in a combinatorial notion. 
and I'll use independent. So I'm talking about it in a probabilistic notion. Uh, but Perl will like infer uh, time from his graph where like a path between nodes corresponds to one node kind of being before the other. You can read off orthogonality or independence from Perl's graph, which is do a pair of nodes have a common ancestor. And you can read off this thing that's deseparation, which is a combinatorial graph property, which is going to correspond to, uh, I'm going to define a thing called conditional orthogonality, uh, which is going to be a conditional version of the orthogonality. In the Perlian world, deseparation will satisfy the compositional graphoid axioms. Um, in our world, we're just going to satisfy the compositional semi-graphoid axioms. The, um, the fifth graphoid axiom is one that I claim you shouldn't have even wanted in the first place. Uh, in the Perlian world, deseparation, which you could read off of the graph, corresponds to conditional independence and in all probability distributions that you can put on the structure, satisfying some rules. We're going to have a thing, the fundamental theorem, that'll do basically the same thing. Uh, Perl does causal inference. We're going to talk about how to do temporal inference using this new paradigm. Um, and then we'll talk about a bunch of applications. Perl's bunch of equations. Yeah, this is this slide is green, therefore it's a table of contents. Um, the rows of this graph are just basically exactly the slides of this talk, uh, the slides in the main body of this talk. Um, so we already talked about the partitions of a set and a finite factored set, and now we're going to talk about time and orthogonality. Okay. Um, I think that if you capture one definition from this second part of the talk, it should be this one. Uh, so we're now going to define the history of a partition, given a context, which is a finite factored set. So we have we have as our context f equals sb, a finite factored set. So s is a finite set, b is a factorization of s. And x is a partition of s. So the history of f of x is going to be the smallest set of factors, so the smallest subset of b, such that if I if I had an element of S, I didn't I didn't show it to you. I took some I have some little S that's an element of S, and I don't show it to you. And you want to know what part in X it's in. If I were to tell you what part it is in, in each of the factors in H, that would be sufficient to determine what part it's in in X. So the history of X is the smallest subset of your set of factors such that knowing the value of each factor in this subset, in this set H, is sufficient to determine the value of X. Um, I also could give an equivalent definition that the history of X is the complement of the set of all factors that are uh, kind of independent of X. Actually, I, I, think, I think I'll just, just Leave that off for now. Here's the definition of history. Um, I'm going to give an example soon that'll that'll maybe make this a little more clear. Um, yeah. Okay. So so this is history, and then we're going to define time from history. Uh, the history, or sorry, we'll say that x is weekly before y, if the history of x is a subset of the history of y. And we'll say that x is strictly before y if the history of x is a strict subset of the history of y. One analogy that one could draw is these histories are kind of like the uh, inverse light cones of like a point in space time or something. And so what, when one point is before another point, then the, in, like the backwards light cone of the earlier point is going to be a subset of the backwards light cone of the later point. Uh, that's like one analogy one could draw to kind of see why uh, before could kind of be like a subset. Okay, we're also going to define orthogonality from history, and we'll say that two partitions are orthogonal if their histories are disjoint. All right, uh, now I'm going to go through an example. Game of life. So. Consider S the set of all game of life computations. Uh, I'm going to do some tricks to make things finite that aren't that important. Uh, so we're going to we're going to start with a uh, negative n to n by negative n to n board, 
And then we're going to uh, kind of push forward the computation in the game of life, starting from this initial board. And we're kind of only going to look at the cells that are uniquely determined by the initial board. So we'll only go so far into the future and, and stuff, and the board will kind of shrink over time. I uh, don't need to worry about that too much. Um, so S is the set of all game of life computations. But since the game of life is deterministic, the set of all computations is in bijective correspondence with the set of all initial conditions. And there's kind of a clear factorization that we can put on the set of all initial conditions of your game of life board, where this factorization is we have a bunch of binary factors, one for each question of was this cell alive or dead at time zero, right? And so the set S is going to have this cardinality that's this large power of two. And we're going to have a bunch of factors. We're going to have one factor for each, for each cell that's asking, was that cell alive or dead at time zero? There will also be other partitions that we can talk about on this set of all game of life computations. Some examples of them are you could take a cell and a time and say, is this cell alive at time t? And there will be a partition that corresponds to the question, is this cell alive at time t? That will separate out those computations that that cell alive at the time t versus those that don't. Uh, here's an example of that. So these three, uh, we're mostly looking at the picture on the right. These, these three points are like cell comma time pairs, those red and blue and green things up here. Those correspond to partitions of the set of all game of life computations, which is, is that cell alive or dead at time, at the given time? And the history of that partition is going to be kind of this shadow that's like all of the cells in the initial condition that correspond to uh, all, all the cells in the initial condition that are uh, squares that kind of go into the computation of, of that cell. All the things that, that are kind of included in figuring out what that cell is going to be. Um, and so in this example, the kind of red partition, the partition that's, that's exemplified by this, by this red square is going to be strictly before the, the partition corresponding to the blue square. The, the question about whether the red, the red square is alive or dead is going to be before the question of whether the blue square is alive or dead. The question about whether the red square is alive or dead is going to be orthogonal to the question of whether the green square is alive or dead. And the question of whether the blue square is alive or dead is not going to be orthogonal to the question of whether the green square is alive or dead because they intersect on these little cyan squares at the bottom. Um, you can kind of see here that they're kind of almost orthogonal, right? There's these, there's these little cells that that kind of affect, that kind of entangle them. Uh, we can kind of formalize this as saying that like the blue the blue square is orthogonal to the green square, given the two little uh, cyan squares on the bottom. And that's what we're going to explain next is how to talk about conditional orthogonality. Uh, I guess I will actually pause for questions right now, if anybody wants to say anything. All right. Yeah, David. Hi. So um, a priori, that would be like a gigantic computation to be able to tell me that you understand like the partition structure or the uh, not the part of factorization structure of that game of life thing. So what intuition are you using to be able to like make that claim that that it has the kind of factorization structure you're implying there? Um, so I, I've defined the factorization structure, right? Like the factorization structure, yeah, I, I, like, I, like you, in this example, like, like this is all working relative to a context. You gave him a context is that factorization. You give a mathematical definition, but you also gave a set with like two to the two to the whatever many things in it. So like yep. the fact that you kind of know which part. Um, oh, you gave us a certain factorization already. And so, yes. So, yeah, so you have very good intuition about history, I guess. Maybe that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the history. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, if I was if I didn't give you the factorization, there's this obnoxious number of factorizations that you can put on here. Uh, and then the history is just like question, like the intuition I'm using 
is like, what do I need to know in order to compute this value? Um, yeah, and you're I actually getting went through and like, I, I went through and I made little gadgets in Game of Life to make sure I was right here, that every single cell actually could in some situations affect uh, a thing up there. Um, but yeah, it's mostly like the intuition that I'm working from is like computation and like information in the computation. Like what, what, like if, if I, can I like construct a situation where if only I knew this fact, I would be able to compute what this value is. But since I don't, it could take two different values. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, writing that, that intuition from the definition is something I'm missing, but I don't know if we have time to go through uh, that. Yeah. I think, I think I'm not, I think I'm yeah, not going yeah. to here. Uh, I guess David walked away. Andrew, you want to say something? No. All right. Okay, so uh, I can hear Rich. I don't know why. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so we're looking at now conditional orthogonality. Um, just to set your expectations, in the Perlian world, uh, we had uh, orthogonality in time, which correspond to no common ancestor and a path between nodes. And conditional orthogonality is this complicated thing that every time I explain this to someone, they say, that's the thing I can't remember. Um, so I think that the definition I'm about to give is simpler and nicer than the definition of deseparation, but it is going to be a lot more complicated than the previous definitions. OK, so we're going to start with the definition of conditional history. So we're going to uh, take E, which is going to be a subset of S, uh, we again have a finite factored set as our context. We have a fixed finite set as our context. Uh, we, have, we take E, which is going to be a subset of S. And we define the conditional history of X given E to be the smallest set of factors satisfying the following two conditions. The first condition is just going to be the same as last time, except we're going to make the assumption that we're in E. So the first condition is if I took some point in S, and I told you that it was in E. I need it to be the case that if I then tell you all of the values of the factors in H, that will be sufficient to determine which part in X uh, that point is in. Our second condition is not actually going to mention X. It's going to be a relationship between E and H. And it's going to say, basically, uh, if you want to ask the question about whether a point is in E, whether an element is in E, you can parallelize this question into looking at H and looking at H complement. So, so the second condition says that if I have a point in S and it's hidden from you, and you want to know whether or not it's in E, uh, one algorithm you could do to figure out whether it's in E is to look at all of the factors in H and determine whether or not the intersection of all those factors, intersection of the parts of all those factors, determine whether or not the values of all of the factors in H is compatible with the point being in E. And then you separately look at all of the factors in H complement and figure out whether all of those are compatible with the point being in E. And if both of these questions return true, then your point has to be in E. Um, I am not going to give intuition about why this needs to be part of the definition. Uh, I will say that without the second condition, if I just took the first condition, conditional history would not even be well defined because it wouldn't be closed under intersection. And so I wouldn't be able to take the smallest set of factors. When I say the smallest set of factors, I'm talking about the smallest set in the subset ordering. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm not going to like really push the intuition of this definition and instead try to appeal to it using uh, the consequences. Of, of this definition. Uh, all right, and then we're going to use conditional history to define conditional orthogonality, just like we use history to define orthogonality. We say that x and y are orthogonal given your subset E if the history of x given E is disjoint from the history of y given E. And we'll say that x and y are orthogonal given a partition, Z, if x and y are orthogonal given each individual part in Z. 
So what it means to be orthogonal given a partition is just to be orthogonal given each individual way that, that partition could be, each individual part in that partition. So we define uh, orthogonality given a partition from orthogonality given a subset. OK, yeah, so like I said, I think that I don't have, like I've been working with this for a while and it feels pretty natural to me, but I don't have a good way to push the naturality of this condition. And I instead want to kind of appeal to the consequences. So good squints to just kind of say that these things are well 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 behaved. Uh, compositional semi-graphoid axioms. Um, so we have a finite factored set, f equals sb. And we have some partitions. Uh, and then we have a bunch of properties here. Uh, the first one, symmetry, says that if x is orthogonal to y, given z, then y is orthogonal to x, given z, uh, which makes sense from the definition. Uh, the second one and the fifth one are uh, kind of converses of each other. Together, they say that if x is orthogonal, I'm going to leave off the z's. Everything has a z in the in the given part. Uh, if x is orthogonal to, or x is orthogonal to y and x is orthogonal to w, if and only if x is orthogonal to the common refinement of y and w. Um, and then we have some other ones. These are, uh, the, the first four of these are the semi-graphoid axioms. There's a fifth axiom called the graphoid axiom, which uh, we're not going to satisfy, but it, it doesn't really play well with determinism, so we kind of didn't want to anyway. Uh, and then we have this composition one, which is maybe one of the more most unintuitive ones because it, it's not exactly satisfied by prob by probabilistic independence. Um, yeah, and so th these are kind of a standard set of axioms. They're modified slightly, because usually when people talk about uh, the semi-graphoid axioms, they talk about lists of variables. And instead of taking a common refinement, they'll union together the lists of variables. And we're kind of in a different ontology, where instead of having lists of variables, we just have partitions of a set. Um, so there's a slight modification for the way people normally talk, normally talk about this, but our, our conditional orthogonality satisfies these compositional semi-graphic axioms, which is kind of saying that they're pretty well-behaved. In addition to being well-behaved, I want to show that they're pretty powerful. Um, and the way that I want to do this is I want to uh, show that, that conditional orthogonality can kind of be thought of a combinatorial property that's kind of an analog of probabilistic independence, um, which is very similar to the Perlian picture. Like Perl has this thing where it's like D separation is equivalent to uh, conditional independence in all probability distributions consistent with the structure of your graph. Uh, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna define a probability distribution that's, that's consistent with the structure of our finite factored set. And then we're gonna have a theorem that says that uh, Conditional orthogonality corresponds to conditional independence. OK, so f equals sb is a, is a finite factored set. And a probability distribution on f is just going to be a probability distribution on s such that uh, kind of the marginals you get by looking at each, uh, each factor will all be independent from each other. So, so what it means to be a uh, factorization on f is your factorization on s such that the probability of any given element is the product of the probabilities of each of the individual uh, parts that it's in in each factor. It's, it's saying your probability distribution kind of factors the same way that the set factors. OK, and then theorem, fundamental theorem of finite factored sets, says that uh, if f is a finite factored set and x, y, and z are all partitions of S. X is orthogonal to Y given Z, if and only if, for all probability distributions on F and all uh, ways of choosing one part from X, Y, and Z, you have this equation, which is basically just saying conditional independence. It's saying the probability of, of little x intersect little z times probability of little y intersect little z is equal to the product of the triple intersection times pro product of the probability of uh, Z. Um, yeah, and this, this fundamental theorem is actually, for me, it was, it was a little non-trivial to prove. Uh, I had to go through, like, looking at, uh, looking at, like, defining certain polynomials associated with the subsets and then dealing with the factorization in the space of these polynomials. 
Um, I think it was like eight pages or something. Uh, okay. The yeah. So the fundamental theorem allows us to derive orthogonality data from probab probabilistic data, right? So it's, it's, it's giving a connection between orthogonality and conditional orthogonality and independence, which means that if I have some empirical distribution, I've like taken a bunch of like samples of something I can like, or, or I have some, like maybe some Bayesian distribution on it where I'm like, just like, I have some beliefs about it that come from wherever I can use that to infer some orthogonality data. And then we can use this orthogonality data to get temporal data. Uh, and so next we're going to talk about how to get temporal data from orthogonality data. Uh, and we also could imagine the orthogonality data coming from somewhere else. Uh, but yeah, we're, gonna, we're now going to show how to use temporal data to infer orthogonality data. All right, temporal inference. So we're going to start with W, which is a set representing observably distinct worlds. Uh, one naive thing th that you might think we would try to do is to kind of infer a factorization of W. We're not going to do that because uh, that's going to be too restrictive. Uh, we're, we want to allow for W to maybe hide some information for us, for there to be some latent structure and such. So instead of inferring a factorization of W, we're going to infer a factorization of another set S. We're going to infer like some other set S and a factorization of S and a function from S to W. So a model of W is a pair, capital F comma little f, where capital F is a finite factored set and little f is a function from S to W, need not be injective or surjective. And then if I have a partition of W, I can kind of send this partition backwards across F and get a partition of S. Um, yeah. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of orthogonality facts about W, and then we're going to try to find a model which, uh, which like captures the orthogonality facts. So an orthogonality database, D, is a pair O comma N, uh, where O like means orthogonal and N means not orthogonal, uh, which are sets of triples of partitions of W. And what it means for a model to satisfy a database is whenever I have a rule that's like X, Y, Z is in O, that means that F inverse of X had better be orthogonal to F inverse of Y given F inverse of Z. And whenever I have a rule that X, Y, Z is an N, that means that uh, that's not true, that F inverse of X is not orthogonal to F inverse of Y given F inverse of Z, right? So we have, we have these, these orthogonality rules that we want to satisfy. And then we want to consider the space of all models that are consistent with these orthogonality rules. And then hopefully we will be able to sometimes notice that even though there are infinitely many models that are consistent with my database, because you can always just add more, more structure that you hide, uh, we, would, we would like to be able to sometimes infer that for all models that satisfy our database, we have that x is before, or f inverse of x is before f inverse of y. Um, and this, this is kind of what we're going to mean by inferring time. We're going to, like, what it means to infer time is we have our database and we take all the models that are consistent with the database. And if they all satisfy some time, then, then we'll say that we can infer time. Okay. So obvious question is how does this compare to, to Perlian temporal inference? Uh, Perl has, has, like, I don't know, there's a lot of stuff in Perlian temporal inference. And actually, I think that. In a big, in a in a strong sense, we have a lot of data. You can often infer, infer stuff in the Perlian case, and uh, like I, I've, I've set up all this stuff, but then there's this question of like, well, how powerful is it? Uh, and for that, we're gonna go to an example. All right, so two binary variables. So let x and y be two binary variables. Perl would then ask, are x and y independent? If yes, then uh, X and Y, there's kind of like, there's no path from X to Y or vice versa. If no, maybe there's, a, there, maybe there's a path from X to Y, maybe there's a path from Y to X, maybe there's some third thing, there's a path to both of them. In either case, we're not gonna infer any temporal relationships. Uh, Perl is really using, 
this is kind of where the adage, I don't know if this is actually true. To me, it feels like this is where the adage correlation on play causation kind of comes from. Is Pearl's like only able to infer uh, uh, causation using like larger structure. However, I claim that this Pearlian ontology in which we have this collection of variables has kind of blinded us from the obvious next question, which is, is X independent of X, X or Y? In the Perlian world, X and Y were our variables, and X, X or Y is just some random thing that I can do. In our world, X and Y, or X, X or Y is just on the same ground footing as X and Y are. Like the first thing I do with my variables X and Y is I take the product X cross Y, and then I forget the labels X and Y. And so there's this question, is X independent of X, X or Y? And if X is independent of X, X or Y, we're actually gonna be able to conclude that X is before Y. So yeah, not only are we gonna kind of be able to keep up with Perlian temporal inference, and not only are we gonna be able to infer some things that Perl is not gonna be able to infer in terms of time, but we're gonna be able to, in this like smallest case, where like Perl was not able to infer time with our two variables, we're gonna be able to infer a temporal relationship between X and Y. Uh, so let's go through the proof of that. Um, so W is gonna be the set of four binary strings of length two. X is gonna be the, comp the, the partition corresponding to the question, what is the first bit? Y is gonna be the partition corresponding to the question, what is the second bit? V is gonna be the partition corresponding to the question, do the bits match? Um, and then we're gonna take an orthogonality database that's just gonna include two rules. Uh, if we inferred, if we got this thing from uh, statistical data, we'd also have more rules because we'd observe more orthogonality and non-orthogonality, but we're only gonna need to use these two rules. We're kind of monotonic with respect to adding more constraints. Um, the first rule is that X is gonna be orthogonal to V. And uh, the, the Y in brackets here is just saying we don't make any conditions or the W in brackets here is just saying we don't make any conditions. And our second rule is gonna be V is orthogonal to itself, which is basically just saying V is non-deterministic. It's saying that both of the parts in V are kind of supported under the function little f. Uh, it, it's saying that both parts of V are possible. And we're gonna get that from this, X is before Y. Uh, so first we're going to show that X is weakly before Y. The theorem says that X is like strictly before Y, but first we show that X is weakly before Y. Uh, we're going to let capital F comma little f be a model that satisfies D. Uh, we're going to let H sub X be a shorthand for the history of F inverse of X, and similarly for H sub Y and H sub V. Um, I'm mostly going to ignore the F inverse part and talk about it as though F is just the identity, even though we're getting the stronger thing that's like all for all possible functions. But for, for time, I'm mostly just going to uh, not draw a lot of attention to that. Uh, since X and V are orthogonal, we're going to have that, that HX is disjoint from HV. I, I'm even going to like call HX the history of X, even though I'm kind of like cheating because there's an F inverse in there, but whatever. We'll call HX the history of X for the purposes of this talk in this in this proof. So H, because X and V are orthogonal, we have X, HX is disjoint from HY. And because uh, V is not orthogonal to itself, we're gonna have the HV is not empty. Uh, and since X can be computed from Y together with V, we're gonna have the, the history of X is gonna be a subset of the history of Y union the history of V. Because remember the history is kind of the smallest thing that you needed to be able to compute the value of X. And so we're gonna have the history of X is gonna be a subset of the history of Y union the history of V. And since the history of X is disjoint from the history of V, this means that the history of X is a subset of just the history of Y, which is saying that X is weakly before Y. Uh, okay, now we're gonna show the strict the, the strict inequality, uh, we're gonna assume for the purpose of contradiction that HX equals HY. And we'll, we'll drive a contradiction here, which means the HX is a strict subset of HY. And so X is strictly before Y. Um, notice that V can be computed from X together with Y, which means that the history of V is a subset of the history of X union the history of Y. 
And the history of V was assumed to be not empty. But the history of V, since it's a subset of history of X union history of Y, is equal to, uh, I'll highlight here, history of X union history of Y, then intersected with history of V, which if history of X equals history of Y is just history of X intersect history of V, which is the empty set, a contradiction. Uh, so history of X is not equal to history of Y, and uh, we get that history of X is not equal to history of Y, and so we get that history of X is a strict subset of history of Y, which means that X is before Y in all of our models. Um, yeah, so so largely what I'm doing temporal inference here, I have like proofs that look like this, where I'm kind of like playing around with different uh, Boolean combinations of the histories and keeping track of when they're in the, when they're uh, empty and not empty and stuff like that. Uh, we have some more complicated uh, examples that use conditional orthogonality, not just orthogonality. Uh, I'm not going to go over them here. Yeah, uh, one interesting point I want to make here is that we're doing temporal inference. We're inferring that X is before Y. But I claim that we're also kind of doing conceptual inference. We're doing some inference of what makes good concepts here. Because X is like, like if you imagined I had a bit and it's either a zero or a one, and it's either blue or green, and these two facts are kind of like primitive and independently generated. And then I also have this other concept that's like, is it GRU or BLEEN? which is like the XOR of blue, green, and zero, one. There's a sense in which like, we're inferring X is before Y, and we can, in that case, infer that blueness is before grueness. And that's pointing at like, blueness is more primitive, and grueness is kind of a derived property. Here, X and V can kind of be thought of as these primitive properties, and Y is like a, a derived property that we're getting from them. And so we're not just inferring time. I think we're also inferring facts about what are good natural concepts. Uh, and I think that there's some hope that this set, that this like, this ontology can do for like the question, but do for the statement that you can't really distinguish between blue and grew, what uh, Pearl can do to the statement you can't, that uh, correlation does not imply causation. Maybe, I don't know. That's That's, a thing we might help. Okay, applications. Uh, here are some applications and future work and speculation stuff uh, that I'm interested in. Uh, first, there's inference. There's a bunch of like, how do we do efficient inf inference? There's lots of different exciting inference related stuff um, that like a lot of it is coming from, we're like making fewer assumptions than Perl. And so we're kind of like, in some sense, more coming from the raw data. And there's this whole inference paradigm that I have like two proofs of concept, but I really don't understand that well. Uh, and then I have applications to uh, applications that are about extending this stuff to the infinite case. Uh, all of the stuff I presented was under the assumption of finite. Uh, some cases that wasn't necessary, but in a lot of cases it actually was. And I, I didn't like draw attention to this. I suspect, uh, that the fundamental theorem can be extended to finite dimensional factored sets, but it cannot be extended to, to arbitrary dimension factored sets. Where by finite dimensional factored sets, I mean like size of B is finite. Uh, and then what I'm really excited about is applications to embedded agency. Uh, so I kind of like, I focused on the, uh, the like temporal inference part of this because I think that it's like concrete and it's like tangible to be able to say like, ah, we can do like pearly and temporal inference only sometimes more and with fewer assumptions and, and, and that feels a lot more tangible. But I'm really like, there's all sorts of places when thinking about systems that I want to like draw pearly and style graphs or just DAGs in general. Like I want to just like draw graphs that kind of where the arrows represent information flow or, or control or anything like that. And I think that like Perl comes along with this paradigm that we kind of come, that we're like working in. And a large part of why I'm excited doesn't actually have anything to do with the probability. I try to like push all the probability aside and I want to like build up the factored set ontology as an alternative to being able to draw graphs 
uh, when modeling agents interacting with things or with modeling information flow, with doing the kind of stuff that John was talking about in, in his talk. Um, and I'm really excited about that direction. Okay, uh, that is the end of my talk. <laughs>